Well, good morning, Silver Creek. How we doing? Good. Doing all right? All right. You guys sound great, by the way. I love singing with you guys. Uh, welcome to Silver Creek Church. If we haven't met yet, my name is Dominic Mass. I serve on staff here as one of our pastors. I get to focus on students and hospitality. And this morning, it's my joy to open up God's Word with you as we uh, continue a sermon series that we've been in called We Believe. And in this sermon series, uh, we are taking the summer to really dive into what Christians have believed for thousands of years. And so we've been looking at doctrine or otherwise known as just core truths to what it means to be a Christian. And one of our uh, source documents for this series has been the Apostles' Creed, which is going to be up behind me as just kind of a reference point. And the Apostles' Creed is a document where church leaders came together. They said, hey, from what we can see in Scripture, from what's being revealed in the Bible, what are some core truths what are some core doctrines that Christians should believe? And, and this has been a document that's been used for hundreds and thousands of years. And so we're taking this summer to kind of walk through this creed and to trace it back to its origin, to, to trace it back to the scriptures that reveal some of these core truths to what it means to be a Christian, for what it means to believe the Bible for all that it reveals. And one of the core themes that you'll see in the, the doc, in the Apostles' Creed is the doctrine of the Trinity. And we've been talking about that for a few weeks now, how in the Bible, God reveals himself to be triune. And so two weeks ago, we talked about how God is the Father. Last week, we talked about how God is the Son. And this week, we're talking about the third person of the Trinity, how God is the Holy Spirit. And this is a lot to take in, right? For a lot of us, we're like, wait a second, that just does not add up. One plus one plus one equals one. Okay, uh, but that's what Scripture reveals to us. It is a truth. It is a paradox. God reveals himself to be a triune being, right? Three separate yet equal people being in harmony and unity as one being, as one God. And what I love about this series and what I even am really enjoying about even this message I get to share with you this morning is there's kind of two focuses. One of our focuses with this series is to inform you, right? There's just so much in Scripture that there is to learn, right? And, and we want to be Christians who are opening up our Bibles and really experiencing the richness of truth in Scripture, especially in a day and age where biblical illiteracy is an all-time high, right? But we don't want to just be informed. We want to be transformed, because one of the goals of coming and getting to know doctrine and getting to know the core truths of our faith is not just to have our heads expand, but to have our lives change. And so this morning, as we look at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, how, how we see Scripture reveal God to be the Holy Spirit, my prayer is not just that you'd be informed this morning, but that you leave here differently because of who the Holy Spirit is. And so I want to let you in on kind of the big idea for this morning's message. There's just kind of one sentence that we're going to spend this morning understanding and unpacking together. Here it is. The big idea of this morning's message is that discovering life in Jesus can only happen through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I'll say that one more time. Discovering life in Jesus can really only happen through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And to really unpack that sentence, to really unpack that big idea, there's going to be three points to this morning's message that are going to kind of act as an outline. And here they are. In Scripture, we're going to look at the person of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, we're going to look at why the Holy Spirit is good news for you and for me. But before we jump into that outline, before we get into the message, I want to kind of give a preface to this message. Because right, if you notice in the big idea for this morning, right, discovering life in Jesus can only happen through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm kind of borrowing language from our mission statement here at Silver Creek Church. Because right? who we are as a church is we want to be leading families to discover life in Jesus. And basically what I'm saying this morning is if we miss the Holy Spirit, none of that's going to happen. But I also want to just spend a moment before we talk about the Holy Spirit to talk about what it means to discover life in Jesus. Because here at Silver Creek and really all over Scripture, what you see is God's plan for you to get to know him. It happens through you getting to know his son, Jesus Christ. Because it's in Jesus that God has redemption for us. It's in Jesus that he has forgiveness for our sins. It was Jesus who was sent to die as a sacrifice 
taking on the penalty for our sins so that anybody who places their faith in Jesus might be saved from the consequences of their sin. And as they lay their sin down at the foot of the cross, what they receive is his righteousness applied to them. So if you're here and you're new to us this morning, if you are maybe just asking some questions, you're not a Christian yet, you're just wrestling with with some of life, I just want to say thanks for being here. We want this to be a church that you can call home. We want you to keep coming back. But my first and foremost invitation to you, if that's you, is to get to know Jesus. Because the rest of this sermon is going to be talking about the life that Christ offers us once we've made the decision to place our faith in him. Because that's what the Holy Spirit gives us. He gives us the life that we keep discovering in Christ. But what first has to happen is we have to discover life. And so, so first and foremost, if you're new, if you're just wrestling with Christianity, hear the invitation this morning to come to know Jesus. He has forgiveness for you. He has a, a life for you to experience and discover with God in ways that you could never imagine. If that's you, if you want to talk to someone or pray with someone, come up after service. Myself, other pastors, other team members will be around. We want to be in that conversation with you. But for those of you who have made the decision, to say yes to Jesus, to let him be the forgiveness for your sins, this morning is a message about the life you and I are offered each and every day through the third person of the Trinity, otherwise known as the Holy Spirit. So let's jump right into this morning's message. Let's get to point one in our outline, which is talking about who the Holy Spirit is as a person, as a person within the Trinity. And so to dive right in, let's meet one another in John chapter 16. If you have your Bible, you can flip it open to John 16. If not, no worries. We're going to have scriptures up on screen. I'll be reading out the New Living Translation today. And and as you flip to the Gospel of John and meet me in chapter 16, I'll give you a little context. This is a moment where Jesus is speaking to his disciples. There's a lot of big stuff that's about to happen in Jesus' life and ministry. He's about to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world. He's about to then be raised from the dead three days later. And then 40 days after his resurrection, he's going to ascend to heaven. But before all of that happens, Jesus thinks it's really important to teach his disciples about who the Holy Spirit is. So that's where we meet him this morning in John 16, verse uh, 12 to 15. This is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He says, There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he's heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me, and all that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. This is God's word, and it's true. If you've ever kind of scratched your head and and wondered, where does the idea of the Trinity come from? I mean, I know I I just read it in the Apostles' Creed, but how did they come up with that idea of, of seeing God as a triune being? Well, it's because of passages like this one. We're in John 16, verse 15. In, in one sentence, in one breath, Jesus talks about his Father and he talks about the Holy Spirit in terms that relate those people to God. In other parts of John, he relates himself to God. And so the Trinity is just not an idea someone made up out of thin air. No, the Trinity is all over how God reveals himself in Scripture. And for the sake of our time this morning, let's just pay attention to the Spirit and how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit in John 16. There's a lot that we could say about this passage. Jesus brings up a lot of different things about the Holy Spirit, but for the sake of our time, I just want to highlight one word that Jesus uses in reference to the Holy Spirit. It shows up in the last verse I read, which is verse 15, and it shows up at the back of that verse. Let me just read it for you again. Jesus says that the Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. If you couldn't pick up on it by my inflection, the the word I want to highlight in Jesus' teaching about the Holy Spirit is the personal pronoun, he. What, What Jesus is doing here is when he's teaching his disciples about the Holy Spirit, he does not refer to the Holy Spirit as a thing or an it or an experience, but he refers to the Holy Spirit as a person. 
And for some of us, we, we know that, right? We, we've been reading some systematic theology, right? We're just Bible nerds. We're like, yeah, Tom, the Holy Spirit's a person. But, but for many of us, this is kind of a ground-shaking moment because what we're realizing is, whether we knew it or not, growing up, we just thought of the Holy Spirit as an experience or, or, or an energy or, or a moment in time. But, but what Jesus is saying here is, no, the Holy Spirit is a person, and in fact, he's not just anybody. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's not the force from Star Wars, okay? He's, he's not an aspect or extension of God. He's not a cosmic entertainer. No, he is God, and he's eager to give away all that Jesus promises. That's who the Holy Spirit is according to Scripture. That's who the Holy Spirit is according to Jesus. He's not a thing or an it or an experience, he's a person. And he's the third person of the Trinity. And I want to tell you what kind of person the Holy Spirit is, using the words of Jesus. You don't have to flip in your Bible. I'm just going to kind of talk about and rewind uh, back to John chapter 14. So if we would have read two chapters earlier than John 16, what you would have encountered Jesus saying is that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody can get to the Father except through him. But if you keep reading in John 14, Jesus uh, says in verse 26 that if anybody loves him and obeys him, then he and his father will come and make their home with that person. What Jesus is promising in that moment is what the Holy Spirit would eventually fulfill in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes and he moves into the life of every Christian, and he didn't just move into their life for one day or for one hour or for one week, he moved in forever with them. And he keeps moving into the lives of Christians from that day forward. And what Jesus is trying to show us is, yes, the Holy Spirit is a person. And as we think about him as a person, he's not just a lunch date on your calendar this week. He's your roommate. He's the one who comes and makes Jesus' promise true that you now have the Father and the Son living with you through the person of the Holy Spirit. He gives you access to the Father. He reminds you of the love that the Son of God has for you. So the Holy Spirit, he's not just someone that we pencil in on our calendar to meet us at church every Sunday morning. He's actually a roommate to us now. He's a part of every aspect of our life. He's with you at home. He's with you at work. He's with you at school. He's a part of your marriage. He's a part of your relationship with your kids. He he knows everything about you. He's not just somebody who meets up once a week with you for coffee and lives on the surface of life with you, just kind of shooting the breeze. No, he knows you. And some of us feel a little exposed by that. We're like, whew, I didn't realize I was signing up for that when I said yes to Jesus. But that is the life Jesus offers us. A life that starts with him, but a life that is discovered through the leadership of the Holy Spirit who moves in with us, who becomes our roommate. And and there's something that we start to notice about the Holy Spirit as we recognize him living with us. We start to realize that he is the busiest beaver on the block. Right? He is at work. Man, this guy doesn't stop. Right? He's at work in the world around you, but he's also at work in your life. And to really unpack that more, I want you to turn to another passage a little bit further into the New Testament. Turn in the right to, in your Bibles to the book of Galatians. We're going to be in Galatians 5 as we look at the second point of this morning's message, as we look at the work of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, and he's giving them a heads up on what to look for. As this third person of the Trinity moves into their life, as the Holy Spirit becomes their roommate, Paul wants them to know that they can be looking out for a few things to kind of tip them off on what his work is up to in them. And this is what he says in Galatians 5, verses 22 to 25. Paul says this, The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things because those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. 
What Paul is telling the Galatians here is, he's saying, hey, I might not know you all by name, but if you have trusted Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I know something to be true about you. I know that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, has now come. He's moved into your life. He's a roommate to you now, and he's at work. And did you catch the list that Paul gave them for how the Holy Spirit's working in their lives? Paul's saying, hey, the Holy Spirit, he is invested in you experiencing the love of God, deepening your joy in Jesus, becoming a more patient parent, becoming a more kind spouse, becoming more self-controlled in those moments of anger and rage. And put yourselves in the shoes of the early church, of the Galatians. Right? They're reading this letter. And you hear Paul start talking about the Holy Spirit and things to look for. And, and you're living in the Roman Empire and you have heard reports about the Holy Spirit coming and healing people. The Holy Spirit coming and giving people the supernatural ability to speak languages that they never knew so that they could share the gospel. But in this moment, what Paul is saying is, hey, all those big flashy things, yes, the Holy Spirit's behind them all. But what I need you to also know is just as much as the Holy Spirit's behind the big and flashy things, he's also behind all the everyday mundane things of your life. He's invested in you becoming the new creation that Christ has called you to be. The work of the Holy Spirit's not just in the flashy things. The work of the Spirit is also in the everyday grind of your life. He's working in those tough conversations with your spouse. He's working in those crazy nights where your kids have you up way too late. He's working in the midst of those hard things at work. He's at work in your life. And I want to just kind of pause and overwhelm you with some other ways the Holy Spirit's at work. And I want to overwhelm you with a list of things that some biblical scholars have put together. When they look at the Old and New Testament, and they say, hey, what are all the different ways that the work of the Holy Spirit is showing up in Scripture? This is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just 12 ways that biblical scholars have identified his work. And the reason why I want to read these to you right now and kind of overwhelm you with his work is because I think often we are tempted and we even doubt that God cares or is at work in our life or the lives of people around us. But just hear these 12 ways that you see the work of the Holy Spirit showing up in Scripture. He gives life. He empowers people for service. He gives evidence of God's presence. He teaches and illuminates. He gives us assurance of God's promises. He unifies the church. He testifies. He guides. He convicts. He commands. He regenerates. He intercedes. Like I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the beginning of the list. The point being, the Holy Spirit is at work. Take a look at these passages later on in the day. Take a picture of the list so that you can go back and read these moments where the Holy Spirit is actively working, whether people know it or not. Let this list be a reminder to you that the Holy Spirit is not just your, your living roommate. No, he is at work. And if we look at Galatians 5, and if we look at this list, if we were just boiled down everything that the Holy Spirit is doing, what could we say is a common denominator? Here it is. The work of the Holy Spirit boils down to this. His work is to lead you. If you look at the language of Galatians 5, if you look at the language of that list, it's all the language of leadership. It's the Holy Spirit who is cultivating character in you. It's the Holy Spirit who is convicting you and me of sin. It's the Holy Spirit who is illuminating Scripture to us and guiding us. The Holy Spirit has been given to you and me as a gift so that we wouldn't have to lead ourselves. This kind of reminds me, a few weeks back, me and my wife, we decided that it would be a good idea to run a half marathon in a few months. And so we're like, all right, we're excited about this. But then I kind of have this moment where I'm like, who's going to teach me how to run? <laughs> right? Like, because I know how to run, but I don't know how to run. I don't know if any of you identify with that struggle. Like, I know how to run in all the ways that are going to hurt me in a few weeks. Right? I, like, I don't really know how to run in all the ways that will actually strengthen me. And I, I say that because so many of us, we step into the Christian life and we try to teach ourselves what it means to be a Christian. And we, we start running and we just start hurting ourselves. And, and there are some of us in this room this morning and we are frustrated with God. We are exhausted 
And we just look at him and we say, God, I'm in all the right places with all the right people doing all the right things. I'm in church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm showing up to Bible studies. But all these right things, they're just not adding up. Like, why am I not feeling life in the right kind of way? And the conversation that the Lord might want to have with you this morning is he might be saying, hey, you're right. You are in the right places with the right people doing the right things. But do you have the right leader in your life? Is it you white-knuckling the steering wheel of all of your own decisions? Are you trying to put the Christian life together on your own? Or are you willing to let the third person of the Trinity who has moved into your life, not just to be your roommate, but to be your leader, are you allowing him to lead you? Because if you do, he will use those places and those people and those things to encourage you, to build you up, to give you the life that you've been called to. He'll use pastors, he'll use those Bible studies, right? But, but it's him who is leading us. Right? That is the prayer I have for myself and our staff and our elders, that we would be people led by the Spirit. Not, not led by our own inclinations, not led by our own hunches, but we have the third person of the Trinity living with us. Right? He is to be our leader and it's in his leadership that we discover that life that Jesus has for us. But guys, it is possible to resist the Holy Spirit's leadership in our lives. The Bible talks about this as grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, Pastor Todd said at the end of last service, you know, it is easy to hide things from your roommate, right? To try to keep some things away from him. But friends, the Holy Spirit's not a roommate that you want to hide things from. He's not a roommate that you want to ignore. He's the leader you've been longing for. And he's committed to leading you towards the life that Christ has called you to. And and if you want to start living your life in a posture that's that's more open to the Holy Spirit's leadership in your life, let let me just suggest something to you. Start each and every day by praying with your Bible open. Let me explain what I mean by that and why I suggested that. Praying with our Bibles open. I say that for two reasons. The first reason is that prayer is a conversation. It's a two-way street, right? A lot of us, we, we kind of have an idea of what it means to talk to God. Maybe we've tried that before. But most of us don't have a clue when it comes time to listening to him. Right? If it is a conversation, that means he's going to be saying things back. And so we want to pray with our Bibles open because for thousands of years, God has been speaking through this book. What makes us think he stopped today? He's still revealing himself in scripture. He's still wanting to speak to you out of the Bible, right? And so if this is, is gonna be a two-way street, if we're gonna be praying, right, we gotta get our Bibles open. The second reason why I say we gotta pray with our Bibles open is because the Holy Spirit is committed to speaking to you with the language of scripture. Right? On that list of 12 things that we just had up on the screen, one of those things was that the Holy Spirit testifies. And if you were to kind of go back and look at the verses where that shows up, what you start to see is in those verses, what's really being communicated is that the Holy Spirit reminds people of what Jesus has already said. He reminds people of what's already in Scripture. But here's a tough question for us. How can the Holy Spirit remind you of something that you haven't spent the time to hear in the first place? How can he remind you of things that you haven't sat down with and wrestled with to begin with? Right? Our Bibles have to be open so that we can even understand the language that's, that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in because he is committed to only using the language of Scripture. So if you want to hear from the Spirit today, if you want to be led by him, start praying with your Bibles open. And, and if, if you feel like, man, that's tough, Tom. I, I, I want to get there. I, I want to be led by the Holy Spirit in that kind of way, but I just don't even know how to pray those kind of prayers. I just encourage you to open your Bible to the book of Psalms. The Psalms is a library of prayers where people are inviting God's leadership into their life. It's filled with language like, search me, O God. Lead me, guide me, convict me of sin. If you need to learn how to pray in this way, the Psalms are your friend. We also have a resource out at the Next Steps desk. We have an article that we've printed off from desiringgod.org. It's an article about how to pray in the Spirit. 
Right? So, so we want to be the kind of church that's helping you take that next step to say, yeah, let's all be led by the Spirit. Let's not white knuckle, you know, the steering wheel of our own decisions, but let's let the Holy Spirit lead us by being people who pray with our Bibles open, who show up at the right places with the right people, doing the right things, and also with the right leader. Right? And as we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, what we start to realize is that he's good news for us. He's not a study hall monitor. He's not a babysitter. He's good news for you and for me. And that brings us to the third and final point for this morning's message, that the Holy Spirit is good news for us. And to really see why he's good news, I want to have us turn in our Bibles one last time to a last passage this morning. We're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 36. So we're going to flip back to our Old Testament. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 36. As you flip there, I just want to give you some context. Ezekiel is speaking on God's behalf to the people of Israel, and these are some of the things he wants to tell him in verses 25 to 27. Ezekiel, speaking on God's behalf, says this. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. What God is communicating through the prophet Ezekiel, not only to Israel, but I believe to us today, is that his rescue plan for our lives is not just to scoop us up once, but to lead us forever. Right? There is that moment where we are rescued. We place our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. But that moment catapults us into a life of discovering more and more through the Holy Spirit's leadership. Right? We see it with Ezekiel when he says, hey, God's plan is to sprinkle you with water, to wash away your filth. Right? That happens through the work of the Holy, or that happens through the work of Jesus on the cross. But then Ezekiel follows that up with saying God's plan is also to then put his spirit in you so that you could obey his commands, so that you could respond to his desires in your life. Simply put, the good news of the Holy Spirit is that he supplies all that Christ requires of you and of me. Meaning, when you become a Christian, God doesn't just give you a handbook and say, hey, try to put the Christian life together on your own. No, God's plan is to give you his spirit his plan is to give you the third person of the Trinity to move into your life, to be your roommate, to be your leader, and not just to be your leader, but to be your supply. To put it another way, Jesus will never call you into something that he hasn't already supplied you for through the Holy Spirit. That's good news because, you know, when we become Christians, we start to realize everything starts to change around us. The way that we see our family, the way that we see our finances, the way that we see work, the way that we see friendships, it all changes. And, and that's for the better because things need to change. But what we also start to realize is the calling that Christ has for us is a high one. We start to wonder, do I have, it, do I have what it really takes to, to be that you know, sacrificial with my spouse? Do I really have what it takes to be that open-handed with my finances? Do I really have what it takes to share my faith in the way that Christ is calling me to? And if you're having moments of doubt of whether or not you can live up to the requirements that Christ has on your life now that you're a Christian, I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit's good news for you because he is here to supply you with everything you need for all that Christ has called you to. He's here to lead you. He's here to supply you so that you can experience the new creation that Jesus promises to you. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many reasons why the Holy Spirit's good news for us. It's good news that, that we have a roommate who's the third person in the Trinity. We need God with us. We don't need just an hour with him once a week. We, we need him in our lives because we need his leadership and we need the supply that he offers us through the Spirit. And in closing, I, I just kind of want to offer the Holy Spirit to you all uh, in a way of an analogy or, or illustration. I wanted to relate the, the Holy Spirit's leadership to kind of someone who's a leader today, right? And the person I'm going to use, he, he's a guy just like you and me. Right? He's flawed, right? And this is actually not a political statement at all, but I think the way that he has led for the past year gives us a glimpse at what kind of leader the Holy Spirit is. 
And, and the person I'm thinking of and want to reference to you is the president of Ukraine. His name is Vladimir Zelensky. If you're not aware, about a year ago, Russia decided for the second time to invade Ukraine. And it's caused a lot of bloodshed. It's caused a lot, a lot of destruction. We need to pray for that whole situation to get resolved. But at the very beginning of the invasion, Western powers reached out to the president of Ukraine. They said, hey, we have a one-way ticket for you out of the capital because things are going to get really ugly. We don't think you're going to survive there very much longer. And the president of Ukraine just replied to the Western powers saying, hey, I don't need a ride. I need ammo. What he was communicating is, I'm not going to leave my people. They, they need me. They need me here. I'm not going to give up on them. I'm going to advocate for their provision, right? Sure enough, days later, there were multiple assassination attempts on Vladimir Zelensky. And after these assassination attempts, the internet would just fill with rumors. The, the, these rumors that, that hey, the, the president's dead, the president says. But then minutes later, Vladimir Zelensky would appear all over the internet filming a video of himself walking in the streets of the capital, saying, hey, I'm still here. And in some of these videos, there's even bombs going off in the background, right? It was quite crazy, but, but in a way, what I want to communicate to you through that illustration is that in a much more perfect way, right? Vladimir Zelensky, he's, he's a guy who's flawed, but in his leadership, he gave us a glimpse at who the Holy Spirit is, because the Holy Spirit, no matter what invades your life, he's not going anywhere. No matter what addictions start to invade your life, no matter what kind of toxic relationships start to invade your life, the Holy Spirit is committed to staying with you, to leading you, to providing for you. Even when the bombs go off, even when the divorce happens, even when depression creeps in, the Holy Spirit is here saying, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to lead you into discovering more life with Jesus. I'll be your leader, I'll be your provider, because I'm here, I'm your roommate. I love you. That's the kind of life that we are offered in the Holy Spirit. And all of it was made possible through Jesus laying his life out on the cross, dying for our sins, and inviting us into this kind of reality where we could have God living with us, leading us, supplying for our every need. So will you, will I, will we be the kind of church that's led by the Holy Spirit. Because if we're ever gonna lead families to discover life in Jesus, if we're ever gonna lead ourselves to discover life in Jesus, the person in charge has to be the Holy Spirit. And man, oh man, he's here. And he's already doing this. I I say that not just to say that. I say that because of the countless people baptized up here. I say that because of the countless families who are being made new I say that for the countless stories that exist in this room today because people have put their trust in Jesus. They've received the Holy Spirit. And the third person of the Trinity is living with them now, leading them and supplying them for all that they need for life and godliness. Let's close now in a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to do this kind of work in us. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for who you are, for revealing yourself in Scripture to be triune, And in your being, in your existence, God, you've chosen to love us with every part of yourself. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and making your home with us now so that we could experience the full life that you've called us into, Jesus. I pray that that would happen this morning and this week as we walk with you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, we are going to close our service in worship now, and as the band plays some music, we are going to respond to the Lord with communion. And and communion is this really amazing moment where we get to remember the sacrifice of Christ, that to make life with God possible at all, Jesus, he laid his life down on the cross. His body was broken, and his blood was shed. And so when we pick up the bread and we pick up the juice, we remind ourselves of that truth, that it's only in Christ that we can discover life at all. So in just a moment, we're going to stand for worship. And as the music plays, you can come forward. You'll exit your row on the right. You'll return on the left. But you'll come forward to receive the elements that are kind of placed at stations in front of your sections. And then you'll head back to your seat, and you'll take those elements whenever you're ready. So go ahead and stand now. The band's going to lead us in worship, and you can begin coming forward to receive the elements.
deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. 